Good evening, everyone. Thanks very much for joining us this evening. And we're incredibly excited to tell you about the new public fertility care services in Victoria and, in, and um, at the women's and how they might be able to assist your, you and your patients through their subfertility journey. So this session is easy, this evening is on supporting patients with infertility through our public fertility services. I'd like to start off acknowledging that, um, acknowledging that um, that we're meeting on the, the lands of the traditional custodians of the land on which our work takes place, the Wurundjeri Woi Wurrung people, the Boon Wurrung people and the Wutharong people. And we pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging and to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in the session with us today. Just some housekeeping. All attendees are muted. Uh, please ask questions through the Q&A box. So you'll have the Q&A box and also the chat box. Do feel free to chat as well, and as long as it's respectful, obviously, um, that questions in the Q&A box. And we'll go through those questions in a sort of thematic analysis after each of the presentations. The session's being recorded. Uh, you'll receive a link to the recording and also a copy of the slides in the post-session correspondence, which we'll talk about later. Please, um, questions will be answered anonymously to protect your privacy. Please ensure that you join the session using the same name as your event registration or the phone number that you've dialed in on so that you actually get your CPD points. If you're not sure that you have, please just put a little message in the chat for the team at Northwestern Melbourne Primary Health Network. Um, before I go on, I'd particularly like to actually thank the people behind this evening, um, Yvonne Beshe and the team at Northwestern Melbourne Primary Health Network that do an enormous amount to support CPD in the area. Um, and if you want to check out the annual report from Northwestern Melbourne Primary Health Network and look at all the work and activities they've done over the last year to support general practice primary care um, in the Kuntapu Alien. Uh, please feel free to, it's on the website. And also Grace Spetter from the Royal Women's Hospital for her support in this second very much. Um, this, um, most, I think, GPs at Northwestern Melbourne Primary Health Network region know about health pathways, and it's being used increasingly for so many clinical issues to support care in place. The pathways are written by GP clinical editors, with the support of local GPs and hospital-based subject uh, expert specialists. There's also one on subfertility. So if you go to Health Pathways Melbourne, you'll find a section on subfertility and that contains the investigations that we'll talk about later that are required um, prior to referral. And there's also lots of information on obstetric care and a whole lot of other things as well. Um, these are some links that will be sent to you later in your post pack and you'll see fertility specialised referral up here that links to some support pages and there's a whole lot of other information to support you, to support the women in front of you. So if you haven't registered for Health Pathways Melbourne, it's free. Um, so if you go onto the Health Pathways site, you'll see a register button and then you'll be provided with a username and password that you use ongoing where you don't need to update it every three months, which is nice. Um, a, little bit, a little bit about me. I um, am a GP and I also work at the women's as a GP obstetrician and outpatients where my special interest is in young mums. I also run the GP liaison unit to support shared maternity care and I have a number of other roles. Um, at G the GP Liaison, you know, we love to, to hear from GPs and community um, health providers and support you so that you can best care for women. Um, and that's our email and we're both Emily and I are available to help you. Please sign up for our Royal Women's Hospital GP Liaison GP News that we send every three months. And just a reminder that most hospitals in Victoria actually use the details that you provide through the National Health Services database. So please check that your practice details are correct, that any practices you've left are not there anymore, uh, and that the practice information of your colleagues is correct too.
So I'd like to actually just introduce the speakers to start off with and then pass over to them. Um, to start off with, Kate, who actually runs the unit, is actually going to give a brief introduction to the Public Fertility Service. I've had the pleasure of knowing Kate for many years um, and she's been the head of the Reproductive Services Unit, I think, for at least 10 years. Um, she's an Associate Professor at, of Obstetrics and Gynaecology at the University of Melbourne. She's the head of the Reproductive Services. She's a Clinical Director and Clinical Researcher at Melbourne IVF. She co-chairs the Clinical Oncology Society of Australian Fertility Preservation Guidance. She's a fertility specialist, a gynecologist, a reproductive endocrinologist, and a special and has a special interest in medical fertility preservation, which she'll speak to us about. She was an appointed an officer of the Order of Australia, well deserved, for her distinguished service to gynecology and reproductive medicine in 2022. Followed by that, uh, Juan, Tim, we're going to talk about causes and investigations of subfertility. Juan, Tim, Te serves as a co-medical director of the Public Fertility Service. She's an Australian trained fertility specialist and gynecologist, um, and she trained at Monash University, has a Master's of Reproductive Medicine at the University of New South Wales and a PhD. With over 15 years of clinical experience in obstetrics and gynaecology, she's got a very strong commitment to research and teaching and has multiple grants and publications. Then that's followed by Rashi Kalga, who's going to talk to us about assisted reproductive technology and treatments. She's also a co-medical director of the Public Fertility Service, a gynaecologist and fertility specialist. Um, she works at the Royal Women's as a subspecialty in reproductive endocrinology and fertility, and as a clinical director at Genia Melbourne City. And her special interest is recurrent miscarriage and pre implantation genetic testing. Then Kate back, comes back to us and speaks about her passion of freezing for the future, advances in medical fertility preservation. And then lastly, Katie Beveridge, who is the operations manager of the Victorian Public Fertility Care Service, is going to talk about her. Well, she has a very long career as a fertility nurse, 17 years in both the public and private sector. And she has that expertise in managing that sort of busy donor and surrogacy program. And she's going to talk to us more specifically about the public fertility service. So thank you to all our speakers. And I will now hand over to Kate. Thank you so much, Inez, and I'd really like to echo your thanks to Grace and Yvonne and Joy for organising for us to speak with you all tonight. It's a great honour and we really value your time. We're very excited to be here talking with you tonight about Victoria's first truly public fertility service. You know, Victoria has a very long and proud history of infertility treatment and management, much more than other states, but that treat, in fact, we were associated in Victoria with the first IVF pregnancy and birth. But unfortunately, over these years, that treatment hasn't always been accessible to everybody who needs it. There have been brave attempts at that, but really it hasn't till now been truly accessible. And um, I'm so thrilled to be here tonight with our team, all of whom are integral to our public fertility service, and I feel very honoured that we have such an inspiring team of people. I'm really pumped about that. The Public Fertility Service at the Royal Women's Hospital actually commenced with um, fertility assistance on the 17th of October in 2022. As you know, we've had a reproductive services, a fertility clinic and low cost treatment for many years, but it hasn't been accessible for everybody. And since 1st of July this year, we've been truly independent Freestand. It's pretty exciting to think that we have a truly public fertility preservation service. And the important things that I hope you glean from tonight are some reassurance that this is accessible without long waiting lists. And this is a very inclusive and welcoming place for patients with a whole range of clinical scenarios. It's not gender or location or economy related. It really welcomes all. And the third thing is that we have top class world standard care. And I think it's really unusual to be able to be so, um, and we're so very proud to offer such a 
truly world-class, accessible, approachable service to the people of Victoria. It is, the government funding is for the whole of Victoria, and that includes metropolitan, rural and regional centres, and we're hoping to be able to do more um, presentations with our metro, regional and rural um, partners because we now have over 11 partners in Victoria. So it's very exciting and we hope you enjoy our presentation. So I'm going to pass on first to Wanting Tay, who's going to kick us off with helping us understand why we need this service because uh, we need to understand more about infertility. Thanks, Juan. Thanks, Kate. Thanks everyone for joining us this evening. Uh, once I get control of the slide, we'll get started. Mm -hmm. Hey, could you just, um, sorry, Grace, could you just move the slides along? Yep, I, I've just got it now. Okay. Thanks, Ines. <laughs> Sorry for that. There was a little bit of delay. Okay, so let's get started. So um, so the learning objective for my talk today um, are to understand the various factors that affect female and male infertility. And also I'm going to talk about the standard investigations and how to interpret some of these investigation results. So just a little bit of general data to start with. According to WHO Global Data from 2021, up to one in six adults has experienced infertility at some stage of their life. So the prevalence of infertility is as high as 17.8% in a high income country, slightly lower in low and middle income countries. The studies um, on 8,500 couples that was performed by WHO, uh, looking into different causes of infertility has identified that 37% of infertility are due to male factors, 8% are due to, sorry, 37 from female factors, 8% from male factors, 35% from a combination of female and male factors, 5% were unexplained, and 50% of the study, study couples um, became pregnant during the study period. So here, this is a very busy slide. So I'm gonna take a few minutes to go through the slide. So here's a list of all the different causes of female infertility. So the most common cause of female infertility is age. So for a woman's fertility decline with age, with the decline usually start around the age of 35. The decline of woman's fertility with age is due to a reduced oocyte quality and increasing ovulatory dysfunctions and also a reduced ovarian um, reserve. Endometriosis, a very common gynecological conditions, affect about 10% of reproductive age women. It has been shown that um, that risk increased to as high as 50% in the infertile females, especially if they experience um, any pain symptoms, including dysmenorrhea. So endometriosis affects fertility by distorting normal pelvic anatomy, negatively impact on the egg, sperms, and embryo quality, and causing inflammatory changes in the pelvis. The next one is ovulatory dysfunctions. It contributes to 25% of female infertility. Hypothalamic pituitary and thyroid dysfunctions can lead to amenorrhea and end ovulation. Premature ovarian insufficiency is defined as menopause before the age of 40. Premature ovarian insufficiency can be caused by previous extensive ovarian surgery, chemo radiation therapy, autoimmune conditions, and genetic conditions such as Turner's or Fragile X syndrome. Polycystic ovarian syndromes, uh, we're all very familiar with that, uh, can affect up to 10% of women. Women with polycystic ovarian syndrome can have infrequent or no ovulations, and they quite often have other associated endocrine dysfunction that can have an impact on their infertility. Tuber factors contribute to about 11% of female infertility. It is commonly caused by previous pelvic, um, pelvic inflammatory disease or infection, endometriosis, and previous um, surgery, including self injectomy uh, or tubal ligations. 
new trial factors um, in pair implantations, either due to mechanical or due to a reduced endometrial receptivity, is the basis of uterine cause of infertility. Congenital uterine abnormality is found in up to 3% of women presenting with infertility. So there are different types of congenital uterine abnormalities. Most of them do not prevent conception or implantation, except uterine septum and agenesis. Fibroid, another very common um, gynecological conditions affecting up to 70% of women. We know that not all fibroid will impact on fertility. Those that can negatively impact on a woman's fertility include the one that's um, submucosa and the larger one. What I mean by larger is at least more than four centimeter, especially, especially those uh, with a cavity involvement. Polyps affect up to 6% reproductive age women. Uh, it's quite often asymptomatic. In some women, it can present with intermenstrual bleeding and infertility. The last one is Asherman syndrome. Asherman syndrome is an acquired condition defined by presence of intrauterine adhesion resulted from trauma to the basilar layer of the endometrium. It, quite, um, it can be caused by multiple previous uterine surgeries or infections. Women with Asherman syndrome can present with menstrual abnormality, recurrent miscarriages, and infertility. So this slide is on different causes of male infertility. So it can broadly be categorized into three groups. The first group is endocrine and systemic disorder. So any hypothalamic or pituitary disease can cause um, gonadotrophin deficiency and therefore infertility. This condition can be further subdivided into congenital, uh, such as idiopathic hypohypo or acquired disease, such as brain tumor, injury, drugs, and hyperprolactinemia. Any serious systemic illness or obesity can also cause infertility. The second group is related to dysfunction of um, sperm production. So in the majority of infertile men who have abnormalities in their sperm, um, semen analysis, there's actually no identified cause that's defined as idiopathic dyspermatogenesis. So a number of genetic conditions can also affect spermatogenesis. Um, genetic causes such as Y chromosome uh, microdeletions contribute to about five to 10% of male infertility. Some congenital and developmental disorders, such as um, Klinefelter and undescended testes, can also cause testicular defects on spermatogenesis. And virtually all acquired testicular disorder can cause infertility. Some common disorder includes varicocele, um, a viral ochitis, especially mom's infection, drugs and radiation. Environmental toxin, um, including things like pesticide, can also um, affect a man's fertility. Evidence has suggested that smoking is associated with decrease of all semen parameters. Febrile illness, prolonged sitting or chronic hot tub exposure can increase heat to the testes and also affect spermatogenesis. So some men uh, have anti-sperm antibody and these antibodies can either occur spontaneously or after some sort of um, testicular injuries and that will reduce their fertility as well. So the last group is related to sperm transport problem. Um, sorry, let me go back. So the epididymis um, and the, the vast deference uh, are very important um, in terms of sperm maturations and transportation of sperm from the testicles um, to the urethra. So if there is any abnormality of this structure, it can lead to um, male infertility. So the evaluations, sorry, there's two other um, disorder that uh, can, can cause male infertility that includes retrograde ejaculation and um, sexual dysfunction, such as erectile air or ejaculation issues. So the, the evaluations of an infertile couple should begin with a detailed history and examinations. So important information that we routinely collect during our initial assessments of the couples includes the following. The age of the couple, time trying to conceive, timing and frequency of intercourse, 
genetic and family history, the general health, the BMI, social, social history, including smoking, alcohol, caffeine, drugs, and steroids. More specific uh, information that we should collect from the female partners include previous pregnancy history, um, in particularly any pregnancy complications and mode of conceptions, their menstrual history, um, looking for symptoms like dysmenorrhea or abnormal bleeding that might lead to um, diagnosis of any sort of gynecological conditions, and previous history of pelvic infections that might prompt you to look into tubal factors. A more specific information for males includes the following, like sexual history, history of any past medical conditions, uh, including things like undescended testes, genital infections, or surgical procedures uh, that may prompt you looking further into male infertility. So here I have listed um, the screening test for women. So you will also find this on our website. This is also a requirement uh, for referral to public fertility service. Um, so the first item is a blood test. So we, we do serology, including the following items, rubella, varicella, syphilis, hep B, hep C, HIV. And if there's any um, occupational exposure, we do all exposures to um, animals or house pet. We do CMV, recommend the CMV and toxoplasmosis as well. Then full blood count, um, blood group and antibodies, iron study. Endocrine profiles, including thyroid functions, sex hormone profiles, prolactins. Um, if there's any suggestions of potential polycystic ovarian syndrome, we recommend that uh, sex hormone binding globulin and testosterone level. And then finally, to assess the ovarian reserve through anti-malarian hormone. We also recommend um, doing a karyotype screening Pelvic ultrasound is essential for investigations of female infertility. Cervical screening tests should be, um, should be up to date and negative. We recommend screening for any sexually transmitted infections if there's any indications. And all couples who are planning to conceive or in early pregnancy should also be offered genetic carrier screening. So all the items with the asterisk at the ends, I will discuss them again um, in more details. Uh, in the second half of my talk. Here's the list um, for the screening test for the men. So blood test for infection screening, hepatitis B, C, HIV, syphilis. Um, recommend doing a male hormones if there's any indications such as uh, sexual dysfunctions or severe oligospermia or azospermia, karyotype. Semen analysis is one of the most info important tests for male infertility screening and then genetic carrier screening. Okay, so the first test I would like to discuss today is the mid luteal um, progesterone. So this is probably one of the common tests that is being ordered to assess um, ovulations in a woman. So it is a measurement of ovulation. Um, I, I kind of feel that this is probably one of the most commonly misinterpreted tests by the general um, um, population. So on the, I would just want to start with some basics um, physiology and here on the left side of the screen, you will see uh, the chart. You can see that how a woman's ovulations, um, sorry, how a woman's menstrual cycle can be divided into the first half follicular phase and the second half, the luteal phase by this important event of ovulation. So this has displays like a typical 28 day cycle where ovulation usually occurs on about day 14. But we know that um, the menstrual cycle length varies. Anything between 25 to 45 days are likely ovulatory. The variation in the cycle length is usually due to a variation in the follicular phase, the first half of the cycle the length of the luteal phase is relatively stable with an average length of 14 days. So previous study have shown that 70% of women, the luteal phase is between 13 to 15 days. So this, this test is also commonly known as the day 21 progesterone test, which I think is very misleading. So day 21 will only apply when a woman's cycle is 28 days. So I have put together here a very simple formula. Um, for mid luteal phase, it should be done on the day calculated by average cycle length minus seven days. 
So for example, in a woman with a 35 day cycle, the mid luteal is actually day 20, 28. Okay, anti-millerian hormone, commonly known as the AMH test or egg count test. So it is a hormone secreted by the granulosa cells of a small pre and early antral follicles in a woman's ovary. So the measurements of AMH reflects the size of primordial follicle pool, the ovarian reserve. It is highly variable with the age group and become undetectable at menopause. In patient planning for IVF, AMH level correlates with the number of eggs retrieved after ovarian stimulation, although not always the case. So this is an example of an AMH test result. So in this report that we could see that um, this woman is 28 years old and her AMH is 21.5. If you look at the reference range here, for her, her AMH is just under 50 percentile. So this is a normal result. So important point to remember our, about AMH test, it measure egg quality, but not, sorry, it measure egg, quanti egg quantity, not the egg quality. AMH level in women without infertility do not correlate with future fertility potential or the time to pregnancy and should not be used to re predict reproductive status or onset of menopause. It is a blood test with minimal fluctuation within the menstrual cycle, which means it can be done at any time of a woman's menstrual cycle. One thing um, that's important to remember is um, the level of AMH can be falsely reduced by OCP use, especially those who's been OCP for a long time. So we recommend stopping the pill for a couple of months before measuring the AMH test. So if, not, if you have, may have noticed that we've listed the current type as part of our initial assessment, and this is the reason. This is because chromosomal abnormalities is more common in couple with infertility. So the prevalence of that is about one in 200 in general population but increased to one in 50 to 100 in the subfertile population. So if a chromosome abnormality is identified, interventions such as pre-implantation genetic testing and also prenatal testing can be offered to the couple. Reproductive genetic carrier screening. So this test should be offered to all couple considering pregnancy or in early pregnancy. So this test provides information about the risk of the couple having children with recessive inherited condition. So just a revision of the autosomal recessive inherited conditions on this um, chart on the left of the screen. So if both couples are carriers of a common condition, as you can see, there is a 25% chance of their offspring having the disease, 75% chance without the disease, but 50% of carrier status. So the McKenzie mission study, which was um, recently conducted in Australia, has reported that 2% of couple, regardless of family history or ethnicity, has an increased risk. The good news is from the 1st of November this year, which is just last month, um, there is an MBS item number for the basic screening, uh, which screen for the three common conditions, that I have listed here, cystic fibrosis. Um, oh, sorry. Spinal muscular atrophy and fragile X um, syndrome. So it is an optional test, but it offers reproductive choice and autonomy to the patients. Some couple may choose not to have the test, but I think it should at least be offered. So the last test that I would like to discuss today is the semen analysis. So the standard semen analysis consists of the following, the volume of the semen, the total sperm count, the motility, vitality, and morphology, which is a norm, percentage of normal form. So important um, instructions that we need to provide to the patients for collections um, to make sure accuracy of the result includes the following. 
So the samples should be collected after two to seven days of ejaculatory abstinence. It should be collected by masturbation, ideally at the pathology center. If not possible, then the, center, the sample may be collected at home, but delivered to the lab within an hour of collection. During transportation, it should be kept at body temperature. What I tell my patient usually is just to keep the specimens in the pocket, um, but not in the bag. So a single semen uh, analysis is adequate for the initial evaluations. But if the test results show any abnormalities, a repeated analysis should be performed in about six to eight weeks time. Lastly, I would like to discuss the timing of infertility evaluation. So if the female partner is less than 35 years old, the general consensus is that infertility evaluation should be undertaken for couples who have not been able to successfully conceive after 12 months of unprotected and frequent intercourse. If the female partner is more than 35 years old, evaluation is recommended after six months. Earlier evaluation should be considered uh, if the female age is more than 40, or there are obvious risk factors for infertility that has been identified based on medical history and physical examinations, such as oligomenorrhea, advanced stage endometriosis, known or suspected uterine tuber disease, male with uh, past history of groin testicular surgery, mums or sexual dysfunction, um, history of chemo radiation therapy in both male and female partner, and history of subfertility with a previous partner. So that concludes my presentations. Um, oh, that's, um, sorry. <laughs> that's, thank you. Thank you very much, Juan. That was really fantastic. Just a few questions before we pass on. Do we all, do we know um, if vaping actually affects male fertility? Um, we there's there's not enough evidence. We don't know. There's not a lot of evidence about it. Um, I don't know if Kate or Rashi has anything to add about it. It's probably better than smoking, oh, but yeah. better yeah. if you don't vape at all. Yeah, probably don't have the evidence. So uh, the AMH, someone's got. Is it a private test? I certainly get it rebatable. So it's it's rebatable, isn't it? No, unfortunately, it's no. currently not rebatable. Okay. Yeah, so, uh, like, no, like, it's about. Yeah, it's about eighty to a hundred dollars, depending on which pathology uh, okay. center like, you go to. Do you require an AMH test before referral? I couldn't. It's optional. Optional. Yeah, um, it's optional. Yeah, so that's so that's one of the questions. And someone said, should we always offer a carry type testing? So certainly, if somebody's got social infertility, presumably we don't need to offer a carry type test. Is that correct? If there's a clear indications, a clear um, cause of infertility, um, you don't have to. Um, yeah. Um, that's probably about it, Juan. So that's fantastic. So now I think we're handing over to Rashi. Is that right? Over, over to you. Thank you. Thank you. So I'll just wait to get access to slides and hopefully we'll start soon. All right, thanks everyone for your time this evening. So I'm going to talk about assisted reproductive technology and the treatments available at the public fertility care services. <clears throat> so currently we offer um, a com comprehensive um, ART service. <clears throat> so we offer IVF with ICSI, IUI, ovulation induction, uh, fertility preservation, both with um, egg and ovarian tissue freezing and sperm freezing. We also hope to next year be able to offer um, a donor egg and donor sperm bank, PGD for genetic testing. I'll talk about what, what type of genetic testing specifically in this talk and the surrogacy program as well. So just um, the talk, this talk is to give you an overview of um, each of the treatments that we offer. So we'll start with ovulation induction. So exactly as it says, the idea is to introduce ov in, induce ovulation in anovulatory women. 
And generally, if there is a, a normal um, semen analysis, we would recommend timed intercourse um, at the time of at the time of ovulation or or just prior at the time of LH surge. It is generally recommended for women who have difficulties ovulating due to hormonal um, hormonal issues. So common conditions treated are PCOS, hypothalamic amenorrhea, Coleman syndrome, hyperprolactinemia, where they haven't responded uh, to dopamine, dopamine agonists such as um, Dostinex, congenital hypopituitarism, irregular cycles. Um, there is a slightly higher incidence of multiple pregnancy um, with ovulation induction compared to um, spontaneous conception. And this varies depending on the drugs that we use for ovulation induction. But success rates in anovulatory women, particularly those who we'd say are young, um, under the age of 35, can be very good, um, up to 20% per cycle. So the treatments that we use, um, First line is oral agents. So we would use uh, letrozole. Um, uh, some people might still use Cloymid and metformin, which can be used um, by itself or in conjunction with letrozole or Cloymid. Uh, we'll move on to FSH injections in patients that are resistant to letrozole or Cloymid or women who have hypothalamic amenorrhea who are not suitable for, for tablets and might require FSH and LH. And then um, laparoscopic ovarian drilling. Um, uh, can also be used in ovulation induction settings, and and that really um, is in a specific group, um, you know, where you um, might be doing a laparoscopy anyway. They clearly have PCOS, and there's sort of emerging evidence that it actually might might uh, be quite um, quite a useful way to induce ovulation. <clears throat> so um, these guidelines are published um, this year. Um, by Monash University, so international evidence-based guidelines for the management of uh, PCOS, and they focused on ovulation induction, um, as this is probably one of the largest group of women um, having this treatment. So um, letrozole should be first-line pharmacological treatment for ovulation induction. Uh, there is no evidence at the moment for increased teratogenicity compared to other ovulation induction agents for letrozole, so there were some concerns about this in older papers. When it comes to letrozole versus Clomid, letrozole was superior for ovulation rate, clinical pregnancy rate, and live birth rate. FSH injections are considered second-line therapy for women who were letrozole or Clomid resistant. Um, and as mentioned before, um, those women who require LH, uh, uh, those women with hypopituitarism or hypothalamic amenorrhea, uh, we will usually use combination of FSH with um, HCG, which acts like LH to stimulate ovulation. <clears throat> With FSH injections, intensive ultrasound monitoring is required, and uh, we are able to offer this service in the, in the public fertility service. Um, we track cycles with, let, with ultrasound monitoring, both for letrozole and FSH ovulation induction. Uh, there is a risk of uh, multiple births with FSH injections. Um, just to compare, we would quote that, you know, with uh, with spontaneous pregnancy, the risk of a twin pregnancy is about 2 to 3%. With FSH injections, it can be up to 10%. So ovulation induction with assisted insemination. So the sperm is um, injected into the uterus um, at the optimum time to catch the um, ovulation window. Um, <clears throat> This is a simple procedure that's done um, in the clinic, doesn't require anesthetic. Usually it's quite well tolerated. So who is suitable for ovulation induction and IUI? So um, fertility treatment utilizing do donor sperm, particularly in uh, same-sex female couples where there is no underlying um, infertility, these women have quite a good prognosis to conceive with IUI. Unexplained infertility, so the new um, ESHRE, the European guidelines, suggested that unexplained infertility is a reasonable first-line treatment option for, um, uh, IUI is a, a reasonable first-line treatment option for unexplained infertility. It can be used in minor endometriosis where there isn't any significant tubal dysfunction. Uh, couples who are unable to have intercourse due to um, some degree of uh, sexual dysfunction uh, IUI can be quite a reasonable first-line treatment for them. 
Uh, in terms of uh, its role in, in mild male, male factor infertility, there certainly is a role for IUI in, in male factor infertility. Um, it's probably, there's no clear consensus guidelines as to what basic sperm parameters <clears throat> are required to achieve a pregnancy with IUI. However, um, you know, that's something we would decide at our discretion when we see the patients in the clinic. If, if the sperm parameter abnormalities are mild, uh, we may well offer IUI. It's not suitable, obviously, in women who've had significant pelvic inflammatory disease um, because of the associated um, distortion of pelvic anatomy, um, women who have bilateral tubal occlusion, and where there are significant sperm abnormalities or triple defect, as we call it, sort of defects in um, motility morphology and, and concentration, which would only be suitable for IVF with um, ICSI. So the ASHRAE guidelines, this is the European Society of Reproduction, um, said that IUI, um, often this is used with ovarian stimulation. So we use FSH to stimulate the ovaries to produce a couple of follicles, is recommended as first line treatment for couples with unexplained infertility. <clears throat> to avoid multiple pregnancy and ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome, care is needed using gonadotrophins in a low dose regimen with adequate monitoring, which we do with blood tests and ultrasound. And the decision to move to IVF is individualized by patient characteristics, such as age of the woman, duration of infertility, um, how much previous treatment the couple has had, and whether they've had a history of any viable pregnancies in the past. At public fertility services, the number of IUI cycles are reviewed on a case-by-case -case basis before advising patients to move on to IVF. So IVF, so in simple terms, IVF is a process of bringing eggs and sperm together in our lab to fertilize them and create a blastocyst or an embryo for transfer into a woman's uterus. ICSI is intracytoplasmic sperm injection. So it's a type of IVF technique that was designed to overcome um, significant male factor infertility due to sperm with reduced motility, morphology, or concentration. And the scientists are injecting an egg, uh, injecting an egg with sperm to facilitate fertilization. So once successfully fertilized, the embryo is then left to develop in in our lab in an incubator for the next five to six days. So the process essentially involves five main steps. The first step is to stimulate a woman's ovaries to produce, um, you know, sort of a, a good number of oocytes. So we know that live birth rate peaks uh, when you get up to sort of 15 or 20 oocytes a cycle. The response obviously varies based on a woman's age and her AMH as one discussed before. The egg collection and sperm collection happens on the same day, um, fertilizing and culturing embryos in the laboratory, then the embryo transfer process, and then luteal phase support with progesterone and waiting for a pregnancy test. So ovarian stimulation with FSH, so follicle stimulating hormone. So we would use recombinant follicle stimulating hormone. Uh, commonly used drugs are, you know, going to left, um, Puragon, um, you might have heard your patients talk about these. Um, on the left is an ovary in a natural cycle. So um, the black circle is a dominant follicle. And you can see those other small black um, circles in the ovaries. These are antral follicles that haven't been recruited that month. Um, and by contrast, on the right side is a stimulated ovary undergoing IVF. And you can see uh, that we have multiple large dominant follicles. And basically, we've used FSH to try and recruit as many antral follicles as we can uh, for the woman in that menstrual cycle. So once the follicles get to um, a size of about 18 millimeters, um, we would line a woman up to have her eggs collected. So egg collection, um, majority of egg collections are transvaginal oocyte collections. So it's a low risk procedure. Complications such as infection, bleeding are rare, but can happen. Um, it's a day procedure. It takes about 20 minutes done under sedation. In women who we, who can't have their ovaries accessible vaginally, we may have to perform this procedure transabdominally, and we'll get um, one of the ultrasound specialists from our ultrasound department to assist us with that. So we'll do a transabdominal egg collection 
that's not very common and usually might be in women either who have um, significant fibroids or distorted anatomy that prevents us from accessing their ovaries vaginally. So in the lab, the eggs are fertilized either by IVF or ICSI. And so the day of egg collection is day zero. Day one here, you see two pronuclei, so that's a fertilized egg. <clears throat> We're now culturing embryos to day five, so that's the gold standard. So day five, that is a blastocyst. The ball of cells in the middle is, a, um, is the inner cell mass, which becomes the, the baby. And the rim of cells around the embryo here is the trophectoderm, which becomes the future placenta. Um, the best embryo is transferred on day five. Any surplus embryo is from that cycle of frozen, you know, up until day six. Sometimes we might hatch embryos um, and the trophectoderm cells here will herniate. And these are the ones that are biopsied when we're genetically testing embryos. So the reason for blastocyst culture is that we have a lot of faith in our incubation systems now with IVF, and we know that the best embryos are likely to make it to day five, and we're not going to harm embryos by culturing them to day five. It allows us to select which embryos are most likely to achieve a pregnancy. And we have a very strict single embryo transfer policy in our unit, which is best practice um, to obviously optimize pregnancy rates, but also to reduce multiple pregnancy rates. So the embryo transfer procedure, uh, which happens five days after the egg collection, um, is relatively painless. Um, it's done awake, partners can be present, an embryo is transferred into the uterus under ultrasound guidance um, using a fine plastic catheter, um, takes about 10 or 15 minutes. And then um, the patients sort of have to sit tight for 12 days waiting for a pregnancy test. They're often on progesterone pessaries at this time um, to support implantation. Um, and we generally will continue progesterone pessaries until the um, viability scan up to seven to eight weeks of pregnancy. Uh, we define a clinical pregnancy as a pregnancy seen on ultrasound approximately six to seven weeks in. And a live birth is the birth of a live baby or babies um, after 20 weeks of gestation. So what are IVF success rates? Um, this data is from VARTA, the Victorian ART Authority for last year. And this shows IVF success rates categorized by age. Now, as we would expect, there is a decline in IVF success rates as women age. However, um, you can see that up to 70% of women in their early 30s will take a baby home within three cycles of IVF. Um, you can see that at 38 to 39, um, the chance of a live birth, and that's what we're interested in here. Live birth is meaning taking a baby home because that's why our patients are here. Um, the chance of live birth is about 25 to 30% for the initial cycle and the cumulative live birth. So the chance of a woman taking a baby home after three IVF cycles gets up to about 40 or 50% at the age of 38 to 39. Unfortunately, after that, IVF success rates start to drop quite significantly in the 40s and pretty much half in every age bracket. After 44 um, IVF success rates, using a woman's own eggs are extremely low. Um, and we have a age cutoff of um, you know, up to 42 for women undergoing IVF through the public fertility service. Oops. Lost my Grace. Can you turn turn the slide to the next one by any chance? Oh, okay. Sorry, we'll just go. <clears throat> so I'll just briefly talk about pre-implantation genetic testing with IVF. There's three types of genetic testing that you can undertake. So the first one is PGTSR, which is structural rearrangement, and that's looking. Uh, that particularly applies to couples who are carriers of a balanced translocation. And we're testing embryos for unbalanced translocations um, to, to basically avoid these couples going through miscarriages. Uh, then PGTA tests for aneuploidy um, and PGTM tests for monogenic conditions. So things like cystic fibrosis, spinal muscular atrophy, where both members of the couple are carriers of the disease. Through the public fertility service, we plan to offer PGTSR and PGTM. We don't plan to offer PGTA. 
So as mentioned before, on day five or six, an embryo can be biopsied. Um, you can see this little hatching part of the embryo and that contains um, the trophectoderm cells, which are, um, which are biopsied um, and, and sent off for genetic testing. So the embryo is made up of about a hundred cells and we remove five cells and, and biopsy them for genetic testing. It doesn't damage the embryo. And then embryos are frozen while we wait for the results of the biopsy. So PGTM for single gene disorders. So obviously the pros are that it avoids um, pregnancy and birth of a child with a serious genetic condition and avoids couple ha couples having to make a decision to terminate a pregnancy after a, you know, an amnio a CVS or an amniocentesis, which is the only other way of diagnosis in pregnancy. The cons are that it is extremely expensive process. It does require the couple to undergo IVF and we report accuracy at about 90 to 95%, so it's not 100%. By offering PGTM through the public fertility service, we hope it will be accessible to couples who have who have not been able to, to have that opportunity <clears throat> so far. So genetic testing of embryos for the variants identified through carrier screening or preconception genetic carrier screening uh, that affects um, uh, the members of the couples or their associated family. Um, accuracy ranges from 90 to 99% and generally familial controls are required for us to be able to create the so-called DNA fingerprint to be able to test embryos. <clears throat> Aneuploidy detection can be built into most of these platforms so we can actually test chromosomes of embryos as well to say that you know this embryo is chromosomally normal is 46XX or 46XY. There is a small chance of misdiagnosis, like with any test, and CVS and amnio should be discussed with the obstetrician during pregnancy. Um, it's very rare that PGD is not an option, um, even if couples have identified gene variants um, and um, majority of genetic conditions can be tested for. And it's, it's very important that couples have uh, very detailed genetic counseling before considering PGTM. Some conditions uh, may have variable expression, for example, hearing loss, and couples might actually not decide to, to go through genetic testing for that. So a geneticist um, review prior is essential. <clears throat> and this has come to the forefront more because of the PGT associated Medicare rebate last year or into 2021. So it applies to couples who have um, the risk of having a pregnancy affected by a Mendelian or mitochondrial disorder, autosomal dominant or chromosomal disorder. It covers the gene workup and it covers the embryo biopsy costs as well. <clears throat> Generally, these conditions, there's no curative treatment for the disorder and there is severe limitation of quality of life despite um, management. And as mentioned before, the patients have had a consultation with the clinical geneticist uh, that included a discussion about the disorder, and uh, it was deemed that it was important to have PGTM testing. And we can test for multiple disorders, so just com some common disorders that we test for. We can test for Huntington's, Huntington's disease, cystic fibrosis, fragile X, polycystic kidney disease, thalassemia. So we can test embryos for um, for, for numerous conditions through this technology. So in summary, we offer a very comprehensive ART service from right from ovulation induction to IVF ICSI PGTM at the public fertility service. Uh, we hope to expand to donor services, PGTM, SR and surrogacy next year. Uh, we audit our success rates quarterly to ensure we're in line with state and national standards. Um, and we're really well positioned at the Royal Women's to treat very complex patients that require tertiary obstetric referral and multidisciplinary team management from the Royal Melbourne next door, which is our tertiary hospital. We're also a state and probably national referral center for fertility preservation, particularly for ovarian tissue freezing which um, and grafting, which Kate will talk about more in the next talk. Thank you. Thanks very much, Rashi. And that's terrific. And there's such an array of services that you offer. So just a few questions. Uh, for same-sex female couples requiring donor sperm, we don't have a donor sperm at the bank at the moment. 
So, you know, how does it work and is there any sort of extra costs associated with it? We do plan to offer donor sperm for same-sex couples. Um, and at the moment, we are seeing them in our clinic and, and doing the workup and actually putting them on a donor wait list. And uh, we are very close to having recruited our first few male donors. And once donors are recruited, they have to go through a myriad of you know, genetic tests, blood tests, serology screening, and the sperm has to be quarantined for three months. So yes, the program may not be available for the next sort of six, three to six months, but we are seeing those patients and we're putting them on a donor wait list. Are we working them up at the moment with the view that we'll be able to do that? But people, can people, you know, um, actually find their own source of donor sperm at the moment and use that? Yeah, so people can, we have patients already coming through with their own known donors. Yeah, absolutely. That, that, so we are able to offer that for same-sex yeah. people's great. There's another question that was answered by Wayne, but I think it's quite um, useful to have just on the video as well, which is the question about long-term um, health issues for IVF-conceived babies um, and also sort of pregnancy and obstetric risks. Yeah, so, I mean, we, we have uh, quite a lot of long-term data now on IVF children, and overall uh, there's quite reassuring data both about the health of IVF children but also their long-term developmental outcomes and even school performance, and we know that they do very well. Um, uh, we do know that there's a slightly increased risk of congenital malformations with IVF and ICSI children, and we're talking compared to spontaneous conception, 3% for spontaneous conception, probably about five to 6% for IVF and ICSI children. And we don't know whether that's because of the lab or whether that's related to the underlying subfertility of the couple, but overall, uh, long-term data on IVF children is very reassuring in terms of their health. And issues about obstetric um, um, sort of prevalence of disorders? Yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, yes, I think IVF pregnancies are probably, you know, probably considered a little bit of high-risk pregnancies than spontaneously conceived pregnancies. They are at slightly increased risk, maybe of IUGR as well as um, potentially um, preeclampsia. Some of that might be related more to perhaps age of the woman undergoing treatment. Uh, endometriosis. The primary, the primary cause of, you know. Issues. Yeah, yeah. And things like endometriosis can be associated with increased risk of antepartum hemorrhage, et cetera. So there's probably some other confounding underlying disease issues that contribute to the slightly higher risks in that population, yeah. Thanks very much, Rashi. And now I'm handing over to you, Kate. Thank you so much. It's been very exciting um, listening to your talks, mapping out why we need fertility assistance and what we actually do. Um, I'm just going to talk very briefly about freezing for the future, which is fertility preservation for young people whose fertility is substantially at risk. Uh, it was working before that I could forward my slides. So we've got a proud history. We've been doing fertility preservation since 1994 as a formal service, and we actually started well before that. So ovarian tissue has been cryopreserved under the tutelage of Deborah Gluck and John McBain since 1994. Some of you probably weren't even born then. And we've been freezing eggs since 1990. We've been freezing eggs since 1976, which is before most of the other people on the panel besides me were born, and freezing embryos since 1984. We've been looking at ovarian tissue research and grafting for many years with research into various freezing techniques. And, um, and really, research is a really big part of our unit, and this is led amazingly with one by one. Uh, we had the world's first birth from ovarian tissue grafted into a distant site in 2014, which was exciting. So we're very passionate about helping young cancer patients. I do want to say that this started from the patients and their families coming to us saying, what can you do to help us? It wasn't led by doctor referral or our own brain capacity, really. It was patients and their families coming to us saying, my child's about to have cancer treatment. My wife's about to have breast cancer treatment. What can you do? Um, so for whom is fertility preservation important? Well, obviously for cancer patients, sometimes it's the cancer itself, the surgery for the cancer. Very commonly, it's the chemotherapy or the radiation therapy. But there are other serious diseases also, autoimmune conditions, renal diseases, cardiac diseases. 
diseases of ovarian pathology, not only, but also including endometriosis. Then we see patients who are at genetic risk with Turner syndrome or fragile X, or there's increasing information about genetic causes of premature ovarian insufficiency. And we're working with the Murdoch on that. We're seeing lots of young women, well, relatively lots of young women who have uh, premature ovarian insufficiency or low reserve, and it's we're seeing it commonly in families. An increasing number of patients being referred to us and who we are welcoming are young patients transitioning, either from the children's, but increasingly now from uh, the community health services where they're being well looked after. Um, so patients that are about to have endocrine therapy or have been on endocrine therapy, about to have surgery, or patients who just want to freeze their eggs or the sperm for the future before they undergo um they uh, they transition formally and permanently and have um, gonadal ablation perhaps. And also we are dealing with patients of increasing maternal age. Now, patients who have what we call elective infertility or elective desire for um, egg freezing, we are unfortunately at this stage not equipped to look after the women's. We don't have um, treatment for that. But the biggest rate, the group of patients we see are cancer patients and over 80 to 90% of young cancer patients are going to recover from their cancer. So that's a lot of people who are going to be wanting to make sure that they can have a normal life and wanting to avoid infertility is the double whammy of the cancer and its treatment and then an inability to lead a normal life and have their own family. Um, you can see here, this is a graph of the increasing number of patients that we've seen over recent years. Um, uh, the total is the black. There was a dip over 2021, 20, 22 because of COVID. But I note that in our data from to October 2023, which is not in this slide, we're 35% above what um, in terms of referrals. So there's increasing awareness and we want that because Previously, there are several studies showing that only between 5 and 25% of patients who have at-risk treatment have been referred. And we really want to get that to 100%, as per all the international guidelines. Just to give you an idea of the patients that we're seeing, if we look at our cancer patients in the women, we've had over 2,780 referrals. And um, a large percentage of those patients have breast cancer or uh, uh, hematological malignancies, leukemia, Hodgkin's, non-Hodgkin's, or an increasing number of bowel cancer patients. And in terms of non-oncology, many, many patients with autoimmune conditions, severe endometriosis or genetic risks for POI, and an increasing number of transitioning patients. We're a fertility preservation service for males as well. We have to remember that. And we see young men with various conditions, including hematological malignancies, bowel cancer, brain cancers, and um, sarcomas. Again, for non-oncology cases, we're seeing a large number of young transitioning people requesting semen collection or cryopreservation for prior to transitioning autoimmune conditions and a raft of others. Okay, so what can we do for fertility preservation? I'm not going to run through these at length, but just give you a little highlight. Obviously, we can freeze eggs and embryos. And in the past, embryos froze better than eggs. So we used to freeze embryos, even if couples hadn't been together for that long. But now our eggs freeze as well as embryos with equal results. So we rarely freeze embryos unless people are in established relationships. We can do ovarian tissue cryopreservation. I'm gonna show you a little bit more about that in a minute. And we mustn't forget ovarian protection, which is a great thing to be able to offer. We use a GNRH agonist to protect the ovaries. We're not exactly sure how they work, but there is now meta-analysis after meta-analysis in patients with breast cancer. And interestingly, it's registered for all cancers. For men, we can freeze semen and we can do testicular biopsy if we have to. And for prepubescent boys, we can do pre, uh, testicular biopsy. 
just a couple of things to update you about egg freezing. Just important to know there's still a lot of old thinking out there. So this is pregnancy rates from vitrified from cryopreserved eggs compared to fresh eggs. And these are fresh eggs that have undergone ICSI because when you freeze eggs, you have to do ICSI, inject the sperm into the egg. So we wanted to um, do a, a rational comparison. You can see here that clinical pregnancy rates in younger women um, are about the same as they are from fresh IVF. It does go down a little bit in older women. Um, we'll be up at our more recent data from this actually shows a little bit more of a similar closeness in the old, over 39, but really the message is you should be doing it well under then. And this is really interesting. This is some data we've recently analysed saying, well, you might freeze eggs for a cancer diagnosis or endometriosis, or you might do it for non-medical reasons, not at the women's, but just as a comparison. So I just want to show you here that the live birth rate per cycle is no different really um, for cancer diagnosis and other medical conditions. Uh, and so I think that that's very reassuring. It's actually not particularly a useful comparison because you only do fertility preservation because you have to, you're not doing it for fun, but it just shows you that um, you still have a very, very good chance of helping people. So ovarian tissue cryopreservation is when we take some ovarian tissue from a patient before they begin their chemotherapy, when we do a laparoscopy. So it avoids any delay. And it's important to think that for young girls, prepubertal girls, it's really the only option available. Theoretically, taking some tissue, which is jam packed full of lots of eggs, gives you multiple opportunities for conception with a large supply of eggs. And also theoretically, it might allow spontaneous conception when you put that tissue back. But it requires surgery. Now, we really need to make sure we're not blasé about laparoscopy. It's a, a procedure that has one in a thousand risk of complications. So, you know, we're not blasé about it. We're very careful. These patients often have anesthetic risks, or, but that's why we like to, to do it in a big place like the Royal Women's. The actual tissue requires a specialised requires specialised expertise. Any IVF unit would, in Australia would freeze eggs, but there are not many that actually have the expertise to freeze tissue. And unfortunately, we've noted when we've had tissue sent to us from other places around the country that sometimes the tissue has been frozen with the best of intentions, but unfortunately with a lack of experience. The tissue actually has a finite duration of function when you put it back. Um, and there is particularly for hematological malignancies like active leukemia prior to induction of remission, there's a risk of tumor cell transmission. This is just to show you, I think I can use my, this is when we put the tissue back. So you can see here about 10 to 12 slices, it's necklaced onto a little bit of suture material. And basically you just pop it in so that you've got good apposition so that you can get blood vessels growing up with ne neoangiogenesis. You just lie your, your slices of tissue in the area. And you can see here pelvic sidewall. We can do it in the ovary and um, also the anterior abdominal wall is our new favorite site. And this is just to show you, this still blows my mind every time, even though it's been nine years. So you can see this little round balloon. This is the anterior abdominal wall, the right anterior abdominal wall where we put some tissue. So nowhere near the ovary. And this is a follicle. And you can see here an ultrasound showing that actually there are two follicles. We actually got eggs out of both those follicles. So that's a bit of ovary stuck inside the, under the anterior abdominal wall. And we actually got two oocytes, got two babies out of that. Again, um, the pregnancy rate, we just want to make sure that it works. There's no point comparing it to um, normal IVF. But in fact, the rates are pretty good with a live birth rate per embryo transferred of about 21%. So it's not bad. It's hard work getting these embryos. It may take you four or five attempts to get um, good numbers of embryos, but you know it is a workable technology and it is now no longer considered experimental. What about kids at our hospital? We have a relationship with the Royal Children's and we have now got tissue um, 
uh, we have patients referred to us with a lot of tissue cryopreserved from pre-pubertal patients. We now get referrals from patients really from post-birth. Um, and we have a really great enduring relationship with the Royal Children's, which in fact has a very robust uh, ethical guideline and protocol. So you can see here over 240 referrals from young girls and young boys. So we have a team that works in our fertility preservation program. We have a phone, fax, email and paper service. You can imagine we're always getting calls on Friday afternoon and we have a team that's dedicated to responding and seeing these patients at the last minute. We have an amazing dedicated nurse coordinator and she makes sure that all the patients are seen as quickly as they need. And it's really a very multidisciplinary team. Um, we have nurses and scientists, we have a counsellor, we have fellows and consultants, and we have some researchers as well as our administrators. So it's a quite a big team. And I guess one of the cool things about it is helping, working through fertility preservation is going to help us develop better techniques for general fertility as well. It's not um, possible for, it hasn't been possible in the past for young patients to be able to access ovarian tissue or testicular tissue cry storage, which is the standard of care now um, from rural or regional centres. And there are two issues about that. One is a lack of education in the rural practitioners and the other is a lack of access and they tend to feed each other. So we now have funding from Sony through our public hospital at the Royal Women's to be able to um, take tissue and um, transport it from rural and regional centres. We get a bit from quite a bit from Darwin and in the Northern Territory and a lot from South Australia and we now get referrals from each state. So it means that those centres don't have to have the expertise in tissue freezing. And the, the, theoretically, these patients, young patients, can be offered the best standard of care regardless of where they live. So that's pretty exciting. We're doing lots of research into egg, sperm, tissue, which is ovarian tissue and um, testicular tissue and also transport. So it's pretty exciting where we are. We have rapid response consultation services and no cost options now with fertility pres uh, with public fertility care for preservation. We're getting, we think, better education of healthcare professionals and we've got improved access to specialised services. And we now can give our young patients a realistic expectation of future fertility with exciting options on the horizon to make it better. So fertility preservation is really important. It should never be um, dismissed or forgotten, and it's a very important part of what we offer at the Royal Women's. So thank you very much. Okay. I haven't got any questions in the chat, but I've got a few questions, which is how long do the eggs last and how long does the tissue last? So from a scientific point of view, in this, um, eggs and tissues really are quite immortal. They can last as long as, as you want. Um, there are VARTA, which is the regulatory authority, um, allows storage for 20 years for medical fertility preservation. So if you have embryos, it's five years, or gametes, it's 10. But if you're doing it for fertility preservation and you can justify it on the basis of it being a medical indication, they can be stored for 20 years. And certainly we have remarkable results. And, you know, patients have their um, tissue thawed or gametes thawed after a long time. We've been using a more advanced more successful technique for egg freezing since the mid um, 2010s, about 2014 to 2016. And, and those eggs survive much better than the ones prior. Um, I was also going to ask about, oh, sorry. Um, um, I think I'm not sure whose question this would be, but you talked about the age-related sort of success rates for IVF. But how about the number of times you try? Because sometimes as GPs, we have, you know, a 32-year-old woman who would normally have a fairly high rate, but she's tried five or six times. So, you know, how does that graph look with regards to success as an independent factor of how many times you've actually tried um, to have an IVF sort of uh, intervention versus age, independent I'll of throw that to Rashi. Uh, so, uh, yeah, we will know that, um, you know, 70% of those patients 
let's say in that under under 34 will take a baby home within the first three cycles. Uh, but then there will be some that will conceive in their third to sixth cycle. Success rates per cycle do start to drop off a little bit once somebody has done something three or four times and it hasn't worked. But um, part of this is that sometimes, you know, an IVF cycle becomes like a diagnostic test almost. I think it's the first time you might actually discover, the first or second time you might discover what the underlying true fertility issue is. So yes, I mean, success rates do drop off after three cycles, but you will still have an increase in cumulative live birth rate up to probably six cycles at least, yeah. And then when do you say to a woman, you know, really, um, you know, the chance is so small they're here yeah. that, you know, because um, sometimes that hard conversation has to be had. Yeah. So I guess at what point do you, you know, suggest a donor or suggest they stop? I think it really varies um, depending on the age of the woman. You know, if she's in her late, in her early 40s, she's got very diminished ovarian reserve. It's quite clear what the issue is. If she's a young patient and we're putting back good quality embryos and they're not implanting, that can be a much harder thing to treat. Um, you know, we don't actually know what the exact reasons for implantation failure sometimes are in younger women. So I don't have a fixed number of cycles at which I tell them to stop, but it is always a conversation and, you know, you always think about it. In the back yeah. of it. Um, I mean, yeah, I don't have Kate and wine have anything to add to that one. <laughs> I guess it's really, as Rashi says, it's a dialogue that you have with the patients. You've got to exclude anything that could be having an impact. You've got to make sure you've give, offered the best treatment so the patient will go away knowing that they have tried everything. And, and you know, I guess the difficult thing in it is for, for one patient, a 5% chance is great. For another, a 20% chance is terrible. Mm. And it's actually surprisingly rare that the doctor and the patient don't get to the point together of thinking enough's enough. Mm. I, you know, you, you, it's not that common because we, we just get to the point where we say, look, we just really don't think this is going to offer you any more help and you can go and talk to someone else. But usually you, the patient got to find girls that you generally the patient gets there before you do. You get, yeah. Well, you get there together, really. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I think it's a really important conversation to have. Um, and I know that there are limits of number of cycles in the public fertility because of access. So we'll talk about that a little bit more later. And there's just one, just as a quickie, I didn't actually understand about the um, the protection. Could you just speak, just give me a one liner again of the protection? Yeah. So we can use medicines to protect the ovaries during chemotherapy. And what they do, it's at GNRH agonist tholidex, like we use for endometriosis. Mm. But what it does is it stops this. When you have cancer treatment, you get this, the assault on the ovary means you get an excess of eggs being released and then mm. an excess damage. So it just stops that. So it stops um, them vision. sort of multiply, not multiply, because they don't it multiply. Stops, but it, it stops, stops more of them activity. getting released. Right. Yeah, that's right. It, it shuts really it down. Yeah, that's, yeah, it's cool. Oh, cool. Um, thanks very much. That was terrific. Now over to you, Katie. Thank you. And thank you everyone for hanging in there. Um, I'll try and be as brief as possible because I know we're running um, towards the end of the session. Um, now I'm uh, probably going to talk about our new, very exciting public fertility service that we have at the Women's. And oh, I've just lost ability to change. There we go. Um, so public fertility service. So as you know, I'm sure most of you appreciate that IVF is very costly for patients and can be difficult to access for a lot of people. So the public fertility service was developed uh, in response to the Michael Gorton review, which was a state government review of IVF legislation, which was done um, back in 2019. Um, the focus of the review was uh, to look at how we can improve the experience of ART treatment for patients. Uh, the outcome um, was to improve the geographic, social and financial inequities in fertility treatment. So there were four main principles um, that emerged from the review. Um, the first was to provide high quality, safe, value based care. Um, so as such, we've achieved our um, accreditation with the Reproductive Treatment Accreditation Committee. Um, which we are very excited to do. As Kate uh, mentioned earlier, we launched that uh, our own accreditation the 1st of July this year. 
Um, we have state-of-the-art um, equipment and provide evidence-based fertility treatments, as Rashi and one have spoken about. Um, and we have access to experienced fertility specialists like the three that you have heard from today. Uh, the second um, principle was to ensure um, equitable access for rural and regional areas. So this is why we've partnered with nine other health services across Victoria to make access um, possible for patients in rural and regional areas. Uh, the service to be inclusive and culturally safe. Um, so the main finding of the review was that certain populations are largely excluded from accessing fertility services, such as LGBTIQ plus people, um, sole parents, culturally and linguistically diverse people, Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people, and people with disabilities or from um, low income earner families. And the fourth point was to provide person-centred care. Um, so as part of developing our service, we have partnered with our patients and consumers to inform the implementation of our service. So um, the Public Fertility Service, there are, are two lead providers and us at the Women's are one, one of those. Um, you can see on the, the map here, the pink area is the areas that are um, the catchment zone for the women's hospital. Um, and as I mentioned before, we parted with nine uh, other services across the state. So um, we've got Northern um, Health in Epping, uh, Bendigo Health, Barwon Health in Geelong, Western Health in Sunshine, Golden Valley in Shepparton, Mildura Base, Southwest Health in Warrnambool, Grampians Health at Ballarat, and Mercy Health in Heidelberg. Now, um, Patients can attend their partner sites for the outpatient appointments and for some cycle management. Um, and then they are required to come into the women's for the egg collection and embryo transfer procedures. So that we're really trying to ensure these patients can have as much treatment close to home as possible. Um, so, um, what are we, Public Fertility Service? So as I mentioned before, um, we, you know, we are excited to be the first uh, public fertility lab, uh, fully public lab in Australia. Now, although there are minimal costs um, associated with some medications and some screening tests, there are absolutely no psych-related costs for the patients, which is really unheard of in the world of IVF. Um, they, we do have a limit of two stimulated cycles per person, this, however, does include any embryos that are created from those two stimulated cycles so that all the embryos can be transferred in subsequent um, frozen cycles uh, at no cost to the patient. Uh, the current eligibility criteria is minimal, as you can see there. So um, it's uh, patients must be Victorian resident and hold a Medicare card. Um, there's a maximum egg age of 42 years at the time of treatment. So this means that um, women that are over the age of 42 can still access treatment up until their 51st birthday with the use of a donor egg, as long as that donor egg is 42 years or younger. Um, so we have initial funding up until um, June of next year, but we are hoping to have that extended for another two years. So we're working with the department on that as we speak. Um, so as Rashi mentioned before, we do offer um, several uh, treatment options for our patients. So we offer the fertility assessment and management, uh, IVF and ICSI, uh, IUI, ovulation induction, um, embryo transfers. And we touched on the donor program earlier as well. So I just wanted to explain that we are uh, have been accepting expressions of interest from potential donors since July when we launched the bank. Um, we've got several donors that are progressing through the service at the moment. And um, as we mentioned, there's a, a very thorough uh, screening process that we um, pop the donors through. Then they uh, have their sperm or eggs quarantined for three months before they become available for patients to use. So we're hoping that early to mid next year, we'll have donors available for um, for our patients to use. So uh, we are already starting a wait list for potential recipients and we're advising patients at this stage that it's approximately a 12 to 18 months for both eggs and sperm at this stage. 
Um, we also have, as Kate spoke to, um, a very busy uh, medical uh, fertility preservation program, which we're very excited about. Um, and I've just popped a link there, which will go around with the slides to the um, Egg and Sperm Bank uh, website. Uh, as Rashi mentioned, uh, next year we're um, excited to be introducing a few other services, such as our, ultra, our altruistic surrogacy program. Um, so this is that uh, intended parents need to um, recruit their own surrogate, um, and then we will be able to facilitate their treatment for them. Uh, we are hoping to um, offer the PGT service um, and we'll be introducing a donor embryo program as well. Uh, there are a few services that we can't provide um, and that includes uh, elective egg freezing, um, aneuploidy testing and um, reversal of sterilisation procedures. So um, how to get patients to us. So um, the referral system, it's a centralised referral system through the Royal Women's Hospital. So no matter which of our partners a patient might be zoned to, uh, all the referrals come through us to keep it simple. Uh, our, we will then have, um, we have triage team which will triage the referrals and direct them to the appropriate uh, treating centre for the patient to undergo their care. Uh, we do have, as um, was discussed in an earlier slide, um, several screening requirements that need to be completed and attached to the referral. And I've um, got the link here, I hope this will work, um, just to our website so you can also find no. Sorry, to... Katie, I can um, bring that in. Ah, that'd be great. Yeah. Yeah. Did you just ah. want the general? Yep. Yeah, thank you. Um, can I drive this still that you've put it there? I think you should be able to jump in. Yeah. Oh, yeah, perfect. So this is the homepage of the Women's Hospital and just under the health professional section, there's a link to the public fertility care service. Let's click on that. Um, there's a little ad for tonight's session <laughs> and um, scrolling down has our inclusion and exclusion criteria there. It has um, uh, the down here, how to refer to your patient. Um, it's got a list of the local services that we are partnered with and then just a link here for uh, the referral form. And if you keep going down, there is also the list of all the screening tests that are required there. Um, we also have, I uh, just wanted to flag here, which is updated uh, on a regular basis, is our um, current uh, wait list time frame. So as you can see, very short wait times for um, patients to get booked in a first appointment with us, which um, is great for the patients. Okay, thanks, Grace. How do I get back to my thing? Ah, thank you. Oh, back. I've gone too far. All right, so just in summary, key points to remember for our service. Um, so patients need to be a Victorian resident with a Medicare card. Uh, the egg age needs to be 42 years or younger. Um, Women can or patients can have a um, limit of two stimulated cycles per patient, which also includes all the frozen embryos that are created from those cycles. We have um, no cycle fees at all, and there's very short wait times. All referrals um, are sent via the women's hospital with the attached screening tests, and we will send them to the appropriate treating partner service. All right. Thank right, you. Fantastic, Kate. I've got a few questions. Yeah, go. Um, so I actually I learned something then that if you have a frozen cycle and you have multiple embryos, you can actually use all of those embryos in your service. I wasn't aware of that. So that's great because presumably many women are in that situation, are they? Yeah. So I guess the aim of um IVF is to um create as many embryos as possible safely 
without um, causing ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome for the patients. And then, um, you know, as Rashi said, we transfer one embryo per cycle and then freeze any remaining embryos to use in later treatments if it's required. So through this service, the patients... Right. The you patients can use of all of those embryos with no cycle fees. And if you've used, I mean, this is a question that's come up a few times for me and from other GPs, if you've used your maximum sort of you know, aliquot at the, at the public fertility service, will you hand over to another private service if that's what the woman wants as a warm handover? Yeah, yeah, we can um, refer the patient on to another provider. There are other um private services there are some other low-cost services around Victoria as well right. so there are other options so the treating doctor in clinic will have that discussion with the patient and we can refer the patient and on. hand over all of the investigations etc um, and keep the GP in the loop I'm sure yeah that gets to one of the questions which is if refer referrals are rejected for you know one or two required tests um, I suppose I think that's just a request to actually feed back to the referrer really clearly about what the test is because we have had that problem in the past where it's just been you know rejected rather than saying mm. well, you just need this test or you know perhaps a little bit of flexibility so that's a comment rather than anything else we um, have just just so you know we, we our triaging nurses do generally um, put in a tailored response back to the GP um, if they are rejecting referrals for anything so they, yeah really, usually okay, yeah getting better which is good um <laughs> If women have had socially frozen eggs in the past, are they able to have them transferred at the service? Um, so that we can import eggs to our service if there's an intent to create a pregnancy. So um, if someone just has eggs stored somewhere else, yep. um, they can't just bring them in to store them within our unit. Um, they can be brought in if they plan to fertilise those eggs right. and attempt to fall pregnant. And if they've got embryos somewhere else, can they bring them in to use them? They can, yeah. And that's actually something we encourage. Um, we don't, through this service, we don't encourage embryo banking. Um, the uh, the idea, gold standard is that uh, patients use any embryos or eggs that they might have frozen first um, because there might not be a need for them to undergo further IVF cycles. But that's really important from GP's point of view because often women have sort of, they've got, you know, really struggling with money because they might be in a private service, they might have embryos. So that ability for you guys to negotiate, I presume, with another service if in that circumstance, is that right, Kate? Will you negotiate and transfer those um, embryos over? Yeah, we, um, we do discuss that with patients when we see them at their first appointments and um, our lab team will liaise with whatever private facility the patient has their eggs or embryos stored at and organised for them to come across. Now, that is unfortunately at the cost of the patient, though, the transport fees to bring the eggs or embryos across. But once they're with us, then they don't have to pay any further cycle fees. That's something I had a conversation about, so that's great. Um, and the last question... Looks like Kate is going to have something to say. Sorry, I just wanted to say it's a little bit unclear at this stage how... If someone already has embryos cryopreserved somewhere else, um, I'm just not exactly sure. Maybe um, Rash, and there are a whole list of things that the team's going through with the um, department about how that will count towards your two cycles. Okay, thanks a lot. That's an interesting, Kate. Um, and the last question is for screening tests. If something's picked up on screening tests, such as hyperprolactinemia, so we've got somebody who's got subfertility we actually find that the person's got, you know, a high prolactin, do we still send them to the fertility clinic or do we actually say, well, oh, actually, this is an endocrinology, this is an issue that we that they need to see the endocrinologist? Go Can I help that. answer that? I think where public fertility sits within our reproductive services and within reproductive services, we have a reproductive endocrinology clinic and a fertility clinic. When we haven't just become an IVF unit, yeah. or a fertility treatment unit. So our core work is still um, assessing patients who have fertility issues or reproductive endocrine issues. 
Right. That is fantastic. That sounds really wonderful. And, you know, the service that you're providing, I'm just really excited for the very many marginalised women that I've seen that really, until something like this, have had not had access to assisted fertility. So, you know, the contribution to equity and fairness in our society, I think, is really profound. For, you know. um, so thank you for all of your amazing work. And, you know, as, as Katie was saying, the wait times are very short um, at the moment. And hopefully will continue to be, hopefully the service will continue to be funded. And it sounds like there's lots of projects coming up this year. So thank you very much. Um, and we will, I'm not sure if I can, I don't think I'll even bother sharing the next slide, which is the last slide, to basically say that in the, oh, thank you very much. So you'll get a post-session email within a week. That will include the slides and the resources discussed during the se session you'll get an attendance certificate within four to six weeks. You'll get your CPD points uploaded. For further education sessions, please check the North List of Melbourne Primary Health Network site. This session is being recorded. It will, there will be a link sent out in the GP News on our website and also on the PHN's website. And please keep providing feedback to Emily and myself at the GP Liaison Unit um, so that we can further refine um, you know, the sort of services and communication that the women's provides to best them, that meet the needs of your patients. Thank you very much, Katie, Rashi, Kate, Juan. And again, thank you to Grace, to Joy um, and to Yvonne for supporting. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a lovely evening.